So last week, my Christmas slides got stolen out of the yard. This week, the people that did that went to jail. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, so imprecatory prayers work. <laughs> Watch yourselves. <laughs> uh, Jesus told us that whatever we ask for, we will get. Whatever door we knock on, it will open. Whatever we are looking for, we'll find. Ask bad things upon the people who stole my lights, and bad things happen to them. <laughs> Essentially, you ask, may they live in interesting times. One of the best curses. Um, but the reality is, despite the passages that we're looking at today, that we don't often seem to get what we ask for or what we seek, or the door that we knock on doesn't open. That is, our foster son died of sins despite the prayers that we had that he would recover. My attempt at getting a particular book published, despite all my agents knocking on various doors, did not succeed in opening a door to publication for that particular book. And when I lost my Costco card a couple weeks ago, I never did find it. Um, now, I was able to go to Costco and they replaced it quite easily, but still, I was frustrated that I didn't see the card. And we wonder sometimes why is it that if we have a passage that tells us that anything we ask for we'll get, why is it that we don't get stuff? And Christians will feel guilty. They think, okay, I haven't been praying hard enough, or maybe I haven't been, uh, you know, maybe there's hidden sin in my life that I have to get rid of, or there's something I've got to do to try to fix this problem. You know, there's some key, some little bit of something that I'm missing. I wasn't just so stupid, I would be able to get God to do what it is that I need him to do. And this, of course, is fundamentally a mistake. That is, it's not up to us to get God to do what we'd like him to do. Uh, but we'll be getting to this. Uh, the passage today is Matthew chapter uh, 7 verses 7 through uh, 12. And it seems quite straightforward. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you'd have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, we'd ask that you be with us today as we try to figure out how it is that you can have us, or tell us to ask you for things and that you'll give it to us, and yet so often we seem not to actually get anything. Bless our time together now, in Jesus' name, amen. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. God has offered, it seems, a blank check. There's no ifs, there's no ands. It's just ask, you'll get. Seek, you'll find. Knock, the door will be opened. It's carte blanche. Seems automatic, a guarantee. No ifs, no ands, or buts. It's not like you get a little uh, receipt about at uh, McDonald's and said you get a free Big Mac if you buy yeah. another Big Mac. Yeah, okay. I'm always going to want to eat two Big Macs. I'm not a teenager anymore. I do not eat two Big Macs at the same time. Um, you'll get this free car if your number happens to be drawn. There's a one in a hundred million chance. You win the lotto if you pick the right numbers. None of that. Jesus says, just ask and you'll get. I have yet to win the lottery. Of course, I haven't actually ever bought a lottery ticket, so that may be part of the problem. Although your odds are about the same. 
And, you know, Jesus doubles down on it in case you didn't get it by invoking our parental attitude toward our own kids, letting us know that, you know, God is like us, like our parents, reminding us how much he loves and cares about us. You know, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? I have not yet ever given a rock to my child when she, one of them, asks for food. I normally will give them food eventually. I may complain that I have to cook again or whatever, but, you know, eventually I have to break down feed them. They have yet started that. Uh, it's just, the passage is odd because our practical experience doesn't seem to match what we're being told here. Uh, you know, I've asked God for a million dollars as if he's a genie and he does not give me a million dollars. Uh, the story is told of Emo Phillips, the, uh, the comedian, he would tell the story that he asked God for a bicycle. And he kept asking God for a bicycle, he wasn't getting a bicycle, and he suddenly re finally realized that God doesn't work that way. So he stole a bicycle and asked God to forgive him. <laughs> that works. And. You know, you have a passage in James that tells us the reason you don't receive is because you're asking, you know, for bad reasons. And, yeah, I can get that if I'm asking for a million dollars or for a new Tesla or for, you know, whatever. But if I'm asking God to heal a sick loved one or to bring them home safely or to fix a broken relationship, how is that something that I shouldn't be asking? Or why is it that God's not going to answer that one the way I want necessarily? And people are always happy to add a load of guilt to our unhappiness by telling us it's our fault that we didn't get our prayers answered. Um, you know, that if we had prayed better, then our daughter would have been healed, or our son would not have died of SIDS, or our mom or dad would have gotten well instead of getting worse and dying of their cancer. Uh, there will be those on television and erstwhile friends and relatives who will explain that we didn't pray enough, or didn't have faith enough, or had some unconfessed sin, and so that's why God didn't hear our prayer. It's always all our fault. In London, there is a chapel that has uh, pictures around the top of it of uh, men that were saved uh, from shipwrecks. That, you know, people prayed for them and they'd come home safely despite all the bad things that happened to them. And one person once asked, well, where are the pictures of the people that weren't rescued? That is, you had people praying just as hard for the men that didn't come back. The men that didn't come back were praying just as hard for salvation as those that were rescued. And so why is it that despite the fact that ask, receive, knock, the door will be open, seek, you'll find, our experience is that that's not what always happens. It is, it's nice that the people that stole my Christmas ornaments were in jail, but most of the time you pray for something like that and you don't get your Christmas ornaments back and nothing ever happens to people that stole the stuff from you. Um, it's as if Jesus is mocking us with these words. Ask for bread, don't give him a rock. Ask for fish, don't give him a scorpion. But God often gives us rocks and expects to eat them up young. Mm -hmm. Thanks loads for this um, sandwich. Uh, yum yum bon appetit. Thanks so much, God. I crammed into coach on a five-hour flight aboard Southwest. My knees are in my face. I have this tasty pouch of stale peanuts to munch on, and maybe the flight attendant will give me half a glass of Coke in a cheap plastic cup that has uh, that has ice in it that has a hole in it. <laughs> Why do they make ice like that? Um, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> to be thankful for. Sometimes, something to keep in mind here, it isn't that you didn't pray enough. 
think about it, you can always pray more. You could always have more faith. Was your prayer unanswered because you didn't work hard enough? You didn't strive hard enough. You didn't struggle hard enough. You didn't scrunch up your face enough. How is it that we're saved? Is it because we work hard? Is it because we do stuff? No, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. The Christian life, that is after you're saved, you don't suddenly now have to start working in order to get things to happen. It's still up to God. It's not up to us. It is what did Paul write in Galatians? You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or by believing what you've heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit, or are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain that it really was in vain? So I ask again, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law, or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. It's not about us. You're asking God to do something. It isn't you. It isn't that you didn't have enough faith. Jesus said that all the faith we need is as a mustard seed. And the point isn't that you try to measure how much faith you have and, you know, is my mustard seed big enough? The point is that you don't need much faith. It's not up to you. It's not your faith that makes things happen. It's God that makes things happen. It's all about Him. Because, and that's the reason you're asking God for something. It's because you can't do it yourself. That is, if you could do it yourself, then you wouldn't need to be asking him. So, it's not how much faith you have. It's not how hard you pray. Um, so you didn't get what you asked for now because of some failure on your part. It's all on God. So again, why is it that we haven't gotten the things that we ask for? Why is it that people still die? Why is it that we lose things and can't find them? Matthew 7, 12 says, So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you, for this comes up the law of the prophets. This is a reminder, and it's two-pronged. If God asks us to do to others as we have them do to us, then why would you imagine that God would not treat us that way as well? Doing to others as you'd have them do to you is simply another way of saying love others as you love yourself. And it sums up the law of the prophets, that is, the Bible, the whole Bible, and at the time Jesus said this, the Bible consisted only of the Old Testament. You wonder what the Bible is about, you wonder what the meaning of life, the universe, and everything is, it's not 42, it is love. It's really not that hard. It's like what Abraham Lincoln said regarding slavery. If you are not wanting to be a slave yourself, then that alone tells you all you need to know about how to understand that slavery is wrong. It is, if it's not something you'd like to have happen to you, then that's a good reason not to do it to somebody else. If you're a man and you wouldn't like to be treated the way women are sometimes treated, then that tells you how you should be acting around women or towards your political opponents, or those foreigners, or the gays, or whomever you think needs to be treated badly. Uh, so don't tell me that, you know, whatever people you don't like, that they're vile sinners and deserve to suffer. What did Paul write about vile sinners? Romans 5, you see that just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person somewhat, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Forgiveness and mercy is what we'd like to have done to us. And so God treats us the way we would like to be treated. He has done to us what we would want to be done to us. So if you think that the answer, um, 
you got to your prayer was the wrong answer, that drowning in the ocean, that your loved one dying rather than being healed, that the relationship ended rather than being fixed, that you're cramped and miserable and coach. Perhaps the problem is not a lack of faith, it's more a lack of perspective. Um, that is, we're very impatient. That is, we want two M&Ms right now. We're not satisfied with the possibility of the big bag later on. We want to have things happen today, not tomorrow. The author of Ecclesiastes writes that we have eternity in our hearts. We know that there's more than just today. The fact that we feel anger and injustice, that suffering breaks our heart, that we rail against the evil that we see around us, that we wonder why God doesn't do something, that we see suffering of the innocent as a significant problem, that we wonder if Jesus' words today are mocking us. It's all because we can hear, we can feel this eternity in our hearts. We know that there is more to life than today the brief span of our earthly existence. There's 365 days in a year. In a decade, that's 3,650. If we live for 100 years, that's 36,500 days. Have I done the math right? Uh, well, except for leap years, yeah. So it's If you make $36,500 a year, that's not a whole lot of money. You might be able to afford a used car, maybe you can pay your rent and have something to eat, but you won't have much left over. 36,500 days is not a whole lot of days. If you're thinking that this is all your life is, is the three, 36,500 days or less. Some of us probably only have, you know, three or 4,000 days left. Scary thought. Um, but again, you're thinking in terms of just this, this little tiny sliver of time. But this isn't all there is to us. We have everlasting life. We live forever. And when we pray to God and ask for something, sometimes it's going to happen right away. Within a week, people that stole my Christmas lights are in jail. This is really nice. I like that. 1987, Ruth and I decided that I would write full time. And we thought within three years or so, maybe, I would <laughs> laugh that you know, we would see success. I'd have things published. I think within three years, I'd had one short story published, and I got paid a grand total of eight bucks for it. It was 20 years before I signed a contract with a major New York publisher, Reader's Digest specifically. Um, 20 years. I had asked God to be a published writer. He did answer the prayer 20 years later. We ask God for things. Whatever we ask, we will receive. Whatever we're looking for, we'll find. <clears throat> the doors will be opened. And we think that that means now, today, this instant, right now. It's like my daughter wanting something. She has no sense of perspective, no uh, patience. Everything has to be instant. And of course, in our civilization, most things are pretty quick. You want coffee, you know, it's pretty easy with the Keurig. You push the button, a few minutes later, you've got your coffee. And so we are hoping that God will answer the prayer for the Tesla, you know, right now. And I want to go outside and there, it's sitting there, but it's not going to be. Um, we would like our loved ones to be healed and to remain with us. We would like to be rescued from whatever bad thing it is that's happening to us right now, right this instant, today. We need a sense of perspective. 
we have 36,500 days in this life here, but we have all of eternity with God. And the prayers being answered might happen today, might happen next week, might happen in 20 years, but God's got all the time in the universe and beyond to take care of answering the problem. <clears throat> and so, yes, anything we ask for or receive, anything that we, doors that we knock on, be opened. It just might not happen for the next billion years. Uh, the in the sight of God is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. There is a passage in Hebrews that reminds us of the importance of eternal perspective. Hebrews chapter 11, it's a section that I have brought up before. It's not a section that you often hear preached on because it's not warm and fuzzy. We tend to want warm and fuzzy, not cold hard reality. Myself, though, I actually prefer reality. And the passage in Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, all these different people are getting various things and having various things done, living by faith. And it says then at verse, uh, let's see, where should we start? Uh, yeah, 33, verse 33, chapter 11. I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, <coughs> administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women, women received back their dead, raised to life again. All very pleasant things, answers to prayers, the way you would like to have prayers answered. But then, some face jeers and flogging, verse 36, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. This is the way prayers get answered, seemingly sometimes. Verse 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The answer may not come today, tomorrow, in 20 years. These people experienced very unpleasant lives, but together with us in eternity, their prayers are answered. All prayers are answered. We get what we ask for. The door that we knock on will open. We will find what we seek, just not necessarily as quickly as we'd like. We must be careful to think and to accept that the solutions are sometimes much more long-term than we might refer them to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together this morning and ask that you bless each person here. Help us to have a good week. In Jesus' name, amen.